So joining us now from Abuja studio is Mr. Meleke, our first uh, group chief executive officer of the Nigerian National Petroleum Com Pet uh, Company Limited. All right, let's go straight to it real quickly. You know, shortly after the announcement by President Bola Metin for the removal of subsidy, the NMPC gave its support to the move. And immediately, at first, before you said that we have enough stock to take us, then yesterday, there was a pump price increase, price adjustments, as you call. What's the rationale for this? One time you say there's enough stock, now you're saying there's an increase, all of a sudden. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, and pleasure being on this program. First of all, stock is different from pricing. You have to be sure that you have enough stock to, to guarantee continuous supply. This is a provision of the law that NMPC must guarantee energy supply sufficiency for this country. But the second part of it is that you must have continuous supply. Continuous supply comes from suppliers and, and those who make the product available to Whether it is locally refined or imported from other jurisdictions, you must pay for it. And now, because of the subsidy regime since 2021, by the way, I'm, I'm sure you are aware that the Petroleum Industry Act clearly indicated that the subsidy regime will terminate latest by the 17th of February 2022. We got to 2022, government in its wisdom, government can choose to do spend money on its citizens. We are completely agree with it. There are subsidies all over the world in very many commodities, agriculture, and so on and so forth. So government decided that in the fiscal 2022, uh, a, a provision was made, irrespective of the fact that the law said you should do price petroleum at the market price. It said, look, we're going to provide money for subsidy. It is not the business of NMPC to worry about this. And we agree completely. We executed that will of government. That provision was made in 2022. And again, in 2023, up to half year, government still made another provision of subsidy to enable NMPC continuous supply at the subsidiary rate. But the complication is that you can make provision in budget, but you have to finance it. And that financing part of it is I'm saying I can tell you, uh, since 2022, when that provision was, was not a single naira was paid to the NMPC to provide those subsidies. And the implication of this is that you have to take the cash flow of the NMPC to continue to supply petroleum into the country. And it has become a daunting tax, almost now almost impossible for NMPC to continue to be, bear this, uh, this cost. And therefore, when we saw the alignment of government, with the realities of the law and the very fact that government does no longer have the money to, to fund this, that means it is eliminated by the facts of the law and also by the realities that government doesn't have the money anymore. And that's why I said, look, we are providing this product. You do not have the money. And since we, you don't have the money and there, this is the situation we are found, we said we will sell this product at its market price so that we will be able to continue to supply product into the market and also avoid any potential default. We're happy that this is not happening, that it's not crystallizing. That is why NMPC saw the realities. We know the market price of these commodities. And as soon as that uh, indication was given, we knew that government can no longer fund it. And therefore, we decided to adjust your price. Nothing to do with anything else other than the fact that we are, we are just observing the, the rules of the game. That's of the law of the Federation. Thank you very much. Hi, Mr. Kiari. Some people were of the view that the upward adjustment of pump price was a hasty move. Considering the fact that, you know, as you've explained, and, and if I had thought some that, that the NNPC and other oil marketers are still in possession of the old stock of petrol that the government had already subsidized. How would you react to this? What explanation would you give to this? I understand you've um, talked about um, commodities and the likes, but there's still that thought around why is there an immediate adjustment, upward adjustment in price? No, this is typical. Anytime you have price adjustment, just like anything in the market, you know, when you go to buy tomato and the price changes the next day, you have the old stock, you sell it at the new prices. Otherwise, two things will happen. You can't go back to the market to procure. And incidentally, also, it is impossible to take it, take it back. So this is reality of market. It is applies to every commodity, not just petroleum. What you won't do is that the supply point today, now, when people buy bulk from us, oil marketers and oil marketing companies, including our retail business, once that transfer takes place, you do it at the market, and then the market adjusts itself uh, subsequently. It's not something that you can say, look, until your all stock finished in your hands, you are not able to, to come back to the new price. It could have been the other way around. Price could have collapsed. You know, downwards, it could have allowed downwards collapse, and all those holding the old stock would have to sell at the lower price to, to arrive at the market conditions. It's really nothing strange. This is a, a, a stock management issue, and uh, it's very typical. No one can do anything different about this. Okay, uh, Mr. Kerry, it's good to see you, and thanks for coming on um, Arise News today. It's very brave of you to come, and we really appreciate your presence. So let me ask you, 
I spent a, a year in Ghana not too long ago, and I know that every single time there's a change in price of petrol, it goes up. So the question I want to ask you is, with the removal of subsidies, are we now going to be experiencing only upward adjustments in price of PMS? If no, when will prices begin to moderate to a lower level, if ever? Not at all. Uh, the prices we are seeing today at our station is the current market price of the commodity. So what this means is that prices in the market can go down at any time, and of course the market will adjust itself. The beauty of this is that uh, there will be new entrants, because oil marketing companies now, their, result, their reluctance to come into the market all along is the very fact that there's a subsidy regime that is in place. And that subsidy regime doesn't have guarantee of repayment back to those who provide the product at, at subsidized prices. Now that the market regulates it, you know, oil marketing companies can actually import product, or even if it is produced locally, they can buy and take it into the market and sell it at its, uh, its commercial price. Therefore, you will see competition, even with NMPC. And by the way, uh, by law, NMPC cannot do more than 30% of the market going forward. As soon as the market stabilizes, oil marketing companies are able to come in. It means that even the requirement of energy security in the law indicates that, you know, you have to be, have, be able to have at least 30% of the stock in the country. This is really what it means. It will be against anti-competition law. Competition will surely come in and definitely the market will, will regulate the price itself. And therefore, this is just an instantaneous price. In any week, two weeks, you know, you can continue to see adjustment that is happening in many jurisdictions. Countries have different approaches to it. Companies have different approaches to it. Competition will guide that. But ultimately, you will see changes in price downwards. Uh, it is very, very potentially very likely. And because efficiency will come in, mind you, as we speak now, every burden of inefficiency in the system, from the marine all the way to fuel station of everyone, including oil marketing company, is borne by the subsidy regime. But as soon as competitions come in, people will become more efficient in their depots, in managing their trucks, in managing their fuel stations, so that people can come to their station. And I'm sure you have seen this even today around locations uh, all over the country, where there's a difference of two to three naira. You see motorists going to the stations where they can have that difference. So this will regulate the market. And on its own, it will come down naturally. And I, I don't see any doubt around this. Well, it's not a fixed price when we are not announcing any price. All we did was to see variable prices depending on our cost by location and by the realities around us, having known fully well that NMPC is the single supplier of the market today. And we are seeing that exit coming very, very quickly. There will be no monopoly. NMPC will not continue to be the supplier of, uh, uh, of, of this product alone. And therefore, uh, we see the comfort for the consumer. They will see that oscillation and that moderation will come, the master will work, including NMPC. I don't see this as a single price for the moment. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Kerry. And Mr. MD, uh, I'm glad that you've mentioned new players coming into the market and there being more competition. My question is the exchange rate. What exchange rate does the NMPC use to import refined fuel into the country? And if there are going to be more players in the market, are those players are going to be using the parallel markets to price what they bring into the country, which will then factor into how they sell uh, yeah. to the rest of the country? I'm sure you must have heard what Mr. President said around exchange rate uh, normalization. And that would simply mean a single rate exchange rate market for everyone. As we speak today, NMPC uses the official exchange rate, which of course uh, will now be subject of the, uh, the stabilization that will be created by the announcement of Mr. President. We see this coming very, very soon and very shortly. Once that happens, everybody, including the NMPC, will accept FX at the same rate. And of course, uh, obviously, when you have change of this nature, it is always a transition. Uh, you will see this happening, a gradual exit of the NMPC in the official exchange rate. And of course, uh, ultimately, that there will be a single market rate in, to which NMPC itself will be subject to. So I don't see any complete of rising of the FX in the market going forward. Okay, so j just, just to follow up. So that means if we theoretically say we move closer towards the, par the uh, parallel market rates, depending on what that single rate is, uh, does that not mean that the fuel prices will go up? Because if you're saying that NMPC is using the official exchange rate and we're using that to determine 515 in uh, Bielsa or 537 in Abuja or 490 I, I, in Lagos, does that not mean that if other players use a rate closer to the parallel market, doesn't that mean we will see higher fuel costs, higher prices than what is being used at the NMPC stations for other players in the market? 
No, I do not think so because uh, what this will do, this situation will do is, of course, I, it will also regulate consumption, mind you. You know, when you have higher prices of commodities, very difficult, you know, you regulate your consumption. And that means the volume of the product you are going to require will come down very, very naturally. At least my estimate is that probably about 30 percent of the volume of the consumption will come, come down. And I've continuously said over and over again that as we speak today now, there is no verifiable data to say the level of consumption in this country. But we know the evacuation from our depots. And that evacuation number will come down at least by 30 percent. If that happens, it also means collateral decrease in the requirement of FX in the market. Therefore, the same source of FX that NMPs has access to, the whole, all of the market will have access. I know and I'm aware of ongoing engagements to ensure that everyone else has access to FX, that single window a market for the FSA. Once that happens, you know, you will not see any spiral, you will not see any change uh, that is uh, significant, it will not happen. And therefore, uh, I do not see any fears around the exaggerated impact on the price of the PMS. Okay, Mr. Kiari. At first, I'd like to ask you, what is the NNPC rate as we speak, or what is the band as we speak? Can you tell us the specific number? Number two, what was the calculation I behind arriving at that number? What was the calculation? I think How this did you is calculate very, tec it? very technical, probably not for, not, not that I do not know. Um, I don't think it's a platform to kind of compute arithmetic. And uh, I completely agree with you that, yes, there must be a basis of this competition. This is the market reflective rest of the commodity so, at this point. So, so, so what informed the market import, reflection? Cost of order. What informed the market reflection now? What were the I, computational forces that informed that market reflection that which you hedged at this price? First of all, first of all uh, the price of petroleum motor spirit is an international price. You can just Google it right now and you'll see it. The, the, the import price is, is not secret. Nobody uh, can, can dispute this. So it's there. You can do it. You can convert to Naira and you'll see what that means. And secondly, along the value chain, you have a number of uh, indices. I don't, I don't know whether I should bore you with this or bore the public with this. You have to have the cost of ship-to-ship -ship transfers, cost of holding this product in the depots, cost of um, also managing trucks from the depot all the way to fuel station, cost of also managing the product at the fuel station, and also several other margins, that of the marketers, that of the depot owners, that you have to factor and there are numbers around it. I can't recollect all of them this moment, but I know that we look at all this all the way to the fuel depot before we arrive at the, the price that you are seeing in the depot. So it's really a lot of science around this, but of course it is verifiable so, and so, necessary. So, maybe subsequently we can actually so, publish how we went about it. So what's the exact band as we speak today? The exact band. We want some exactitude. There's no, there is no band. My brother, there is no ban. You see that the price in Maiduguri is different from Kano, is different from Sakota, is different from Abuja. Oweri and so on and so forth. There is nothing like ban. I think that is the era of, uh, of the past where we create bans around pricing. You know, the market doesn't work in ban, it works around realities. So whatever it takes you to take this product from Lagos into Maiduguri is very different from what it will do to take you into Abuja. And therefore, those computations, every marketer does this. Well, it's for every commodity. By the way, if you buy diesel, that you know today that diesel probably in Abuja is somewhere around 640, and it will not be the same price in Maiduguri, it will not be the same price in Sokotan, and also it can't be the same price in, in Lagos. So it's distinct. You know, oil companies do this. It's not secret. And competition will come in. It's not the kind of Coca-Cola stuff that you have single price for everything all over the country. No, it doesn't work that way. And therefore, every company looks at the competition. And by the way, as we go forward, NMPC will also become the competition. Companies will see the prices of NMPC and gauge their pricing around this increasing efficiency so that ultimately customers can come to them. So there's nothing like a band that, that will exist now. It is a market reality price that it will be seen from time to time. Companies will adjust. Sometimes, uh, by the way, I'm sure you are aware that sometimes companies can actually lose to sell. When you have prejudice from your bank, which is cheaper for you to sell up your product at a lower price and pay up your bank than to keep it and sell at the same price that is little for companies can opt to this. And this is how trading works. Companies sometimes lose to take position in the future. So a number of market dynamics will come into play, and it's not really about a ban. And I think the era of bans are gone. Competition will come in, and I'm sure that, you know, even in age market today, there's nothing like a band that you can, you can see, but people still have differentiated price. Even within Abuja today now, one fuel station sells higher than the other. And this is also reality. And this is a factor of either efficiency, desperation, the need to go back to the market, and very many other conditions that companies, companies see. 
And of course, the choice of the customer, and I'm sure some of the executive customers, you know, they'll ask the truck to bring the diesel into their homes. You know, obviously you're going to pay more because you're paying for that comfort and that luxury. So there is nothing like a ban in pricing petroleum oil, just like any other community, commodity. But I, I, I should, am I suggesting that the Coca-Cola kind of situation where the price in Lagos is the same thing as the price in, in Maiduguri is, is very unlikely for this commodity because it is an essential commodity. It's not like Coca-Cola where uh, when customers uh, take, they don't do it by choice and they can actually decide to throw it away, that you don't have to take it. So this is different. That kind of a single price across the country as a result of market forces or, or, cost, or, or trader choices cannot happen in, in petroleum products. And therefore, you will have no ban just coming straight to your question. There will be no bans to be determined by market reality. And also, that competition will make the general members of the general public benefit from it. And competition is good always. Uh, in the absence of this, that is why you see all the issues around uh, commodity pricing, particularly for PMS across our country, all the issues around that you see, fraud, all kinds of things, round tripping, cross-border smuggling, and so on and so forth, that I've always advocated and no one can stop it, only the market can regulate it. And I believe that the market will regulate it more than anything else to retain the value here, value for the ordinary people who will benefit from this, while the, the, the affluent ones you know, can afford what, what they can do. I think this is just the reality that it is going to do. You will see massive change in the market structure, you will see that reality will come in. Thank you. All right, thanks, Mr. Kiari. I'd like to go back to my earlier question with regards to why the hasty price hike. From my understanding, there's a budget provision for subsidy till the end of June. That's what the former Minister of Finance said, the previous administration said, and that's what Nigerians had accepted. Why didn't you wait to increase the price till at least the 1st of July after the subsidy provision had expired? Are you saying that you haven't paid subsidy on the fuel that you have adjusted the prices up? Because many Nigerians are wondering why the sudden price hike. I think that's the question that people want to know this morning. Why immediate, why not wait till the end of June for when which the, um, there was a provision for subsidy in the budget? Actually, that is the issue. You know, you can make budgets. You know, there was provision of 6 trillion naira in 2022 and 3.7 trillion naira in 2023, up to half year. You know, I can tell you that not a single naira of that has been funded. And what we, did we do as NNPC? Because by law, we are required to pay taxes, royalties, as any other, com any other company. And these are our fiscal obligations and, of course, ultimately to declare profit to its, our shareholders. But I'm sure you are aware that this company has broken even. We are doing very well. We have profit level of 687 trillion naira in fiscal 2021. So, so this is huge, but you can't make that uh, dividend available to its shareholder because you have the burden of subsidy. And that's where the subsidy must be, must be financed because the provision in the law simply means that government will write a check to NMPC at the end of the month for the service that we are providing to the nation. That check has not been written at all. And then what did we do? We held back the fiscal obligation because there's nothing we can do. There's no other way of doing it. Despite the fact that we are holding back the fiscal obligations for 2022 and half year 2023, there's still a net deficit of 2.8 trillion naira that the corporation should have written check for us. And therefore, you have the budget absolutely yeah, as a provision. You do not have the cash to back it up. And you also don't have the fiscal obligation that should have come from the NFPC to settle for this. And definitely it means that uh, there is provision of the end of the June, yes, absolutely in the, in, the, in the Appropriation Act, but you do not have the cash backing. And therefore you don't have the money, you can't give what you don't have. And I want to borrow something that I had a very, very uh, senior person said this. I said you can't pull a water from a dry well. It doesn't exist. Once it's not there, there is nothing you can do. You can't provide for it. And therefore, the provision in the budget is clearly, yes, that's provision of the law. It must be funded. But the funding for petroleum, for imports, for bringing product into your country, for taking it to the fuel center, won't wait for when you are ready to be, provide the financing. Your customers, your suppliers are not going to wait for this. The oil marketing companies who will take this product from you, they don't care how you do it. Once you, these products are with you, they will ensure that it's, it goes into the market. So nobody's going to wait. They say it's a ticking clock that doesn't stop. The moment it stops, the whole energy system of the country will stop. And therefore, it won't wait for subsidy. But we can't wait for anything other than the very fact that if we continue with this, it will go to a default point where we'll not be able to produce, even if it is processed locally. Let me make it very clear. There's this distinction that, yes, of course, the cost of import is in FX. And therefore, if we make it locally, you're going to have, it's not going to change anything. Even when you do local...
that we get to that point of default because the refineries, whether it is our own when we complete or the Rangosa refinery when it becomes fully commercially available, there will still be a balance of, uh, of course, that means that there must be a cost that is reflective of the cost of production, cost of crude oil, and so many other things that come with it. And ultimately, you will still end up with subsidy because you have to sell it at the get at the price that is subsidized. Once that happens, you will have that delta and you do not have the cash to back it up. And it's a very dire situation for our country. We understand this. And these are very wider issues around this. But the, the key issue is that you know, this country no longer have the resources to back this up. It's not really issue, no longer an issue around whether or not when you remove subsidy, you're going to have money to do something else with it. You know, today, you just don't have the money. And you can have the numbers in the appropriation, but we don't have the cash in our hands. OK, so uh, Mr. Kerry, many people are of the view that uh, the common man are the ultimate beneficiaries of the fuel subsidy regime and they will suffer. And the suffering has begun because of the price <coughs> of transport across the board. But there are other people who say that subsidy only benefit the rich and that it is uh, subsidizing the rich people. Where do you stand in this conversation or this debate? And um, what's your thought uh, uh, in terms of ameliorating uh, the suffering of the poor? Yes, first of all, let me explain what it means when we say the, the rich benefit from this. But I'm sure if you look at our statistics, you know, over time, just go take a look at the statistics of the evacuation from depots of the volume of products that go out. Uh, by sheer, not coincidence, this is not an accident, you will see that the huge volumes goes to locations where you have higher standard of living in the country. I don't want to mention the names of those locations. When you check, you will see this. And therefore, the almost 48% of the total evacuation or the consumption in this country goes to practically few locations where you know, essentially the elites live. And of course, that means that all of us are subsidizing that small community of people. And, and it's very reflective. When you come to Abuja today now, you see convoy of cars, of executives, of, uh, of politicians, of government, uh, government leaders, of business leaders of all sorts. You know, you see convoy of five to six cars, you know, take, uh, consuming up to 100 liters each. And of course, uh, the meaning of this is that we are actually subsidizing this, this class of people. And a car owners, it's not just about transport. I'm sure you are aware that most of the transportation that is used for the movement of commodities of food, of taking product from the, from the farms into the markets, and everything is largely driven by, by, by the uh, edge or diesel. And therefore, if there's anything like something that should be of value to the common man, it should go to, uh, to, to the edge. But that's not there. But what you have is on PMS. Yes, transportation, today the infrastructure for transportation is still being developed. It's, it doesn't go into the optimum position, but the fact still remains is that uh, PMS plays a significant role in transportation. I agree with it completely. That's why you, I, I had a lot of Nigerians, you know, saying, oh, the price of uh, transportation is, has, uh, has risen very quickly. It's got to impact the ordinary man. Absolutely, yes. The ordinary man, the common man, the vulnerable tax board hit, the, the value of the health subsidy goes to the elites, and also the pains that subsidy removal credits also comes to them. So either way, you, you lose. And therefore, what will this do to to the ordinary, ordinary man. First of all, market will regulate it. There's no doubt about it. Market will also regulate the cost of transportation. There's no doubt about it. What people do is that they quickly juggle. There's no arithmetic around it. People say, okay, yesterday I bought a fuel at 200 naira, today it's 500, and therefore I'm going to jack up my price of uh, transportation by some number, three times, four times, all of them. The market itself will regulate that. It will come down because realities will come down. People will have no choice than to allow their vehicles to come with passengers, and realities will, will down on even the transportation segment of our society to come down this price. So it will come down. There is always this truth around uh, when prices change upwards, you know, people will react knee jack, and after that, come, it comes back to reality. Yes, will that, will that mean immediate pain for, for, for ordinary people? Yes, absolutely. Uh, there is no doubt about it. But I am also aware. That you know, in every jurisdiction where such situations come, unfortunately, today's situation is very different. When you do a calculated and measured exit from a subsidy regime, it's a very different conversation than when you are forced by realities or the very fact that you can no longer afford it. You can do subsidy, you can continue to do it. It's about priorities. For, for instance, if I say, look, this can't, let's abandon everything, let's do the subsidy, let's not pay salary, let's not do transportation, let's not do roads. This is a choice that will come in. I don't think this is a wise choice. To make as in today's case you know the alternatives to subsidy are better 
than, than not doing it. And therefore, you're better off allowing the other segments not to fund this. Because as today, today you have to, for you to keep the subsidy in today's context, you have to abandon many things you are physically doing today side by side with the subsidy regime today. And therefore, it is just not available for you. It's a different context. Now, would something change? Absolutely. And I'm aware there are engagement going on with, uh, uh, with our stakeholders to see, okay, what can we do? What can government do to its citizen? It's very typical. And I also understand this. The disposition itself of the president-elect, uh, Mr. President, is, is very, very clear. People-centric. Make sure the ordinary man doesn't suffer. Make sure that we alleviate their suffering and by every means possible so that there is greater expansion of the economy, more people back to work, more people are able to access the resources of the state, and ultimately there will be prosperity around the country. This is absolutely credible and this is functional and it is possible. But for you to do this, you must have to face the functional market situation. And the market situation is that you can't afford it, you have to do something about it, and of course interventions will naturally come. And I'm aware that a number of steps are being taken, some of them are in, out there in the space, but I know that there are things that are going on concurrent and, and, and at the same time with what is going on, yes. Thank you so much, sir. So looking at the future now, uh, you've talked a lot about smuggling because of arbitrage, and that's the price differential in fuel here and in other countries. Can we say now looking to the future that this um, market regulated regime for the downstream sector kills off smuggling of petrol. And does that mean we will possibly get more accurate data on consumption going forward? Absolutely, the market will, will control volumes today, not NNPC, not the regulator. So the market will control the volume of consumption. And it will be very obvious. And data will be now be more credible because even the marketing companies will now have to face the reality of the market and also uh, working with their banks. So those data will clearly become very, very available, very distant and very, very different. So there is nothing around it. There is no uh, arbitrage around it for you to take advantage of. Therefore, the numbers will become real and it will have very, very secure and absolute data. Of course, technology can come to play, uh, bringing out the right data going forward. I know a number of steps are being taken by government to ensure that data collection is appropriate at the fuel station, up to the fuel station level. So data will be available also only by gravity. But of course, in the reality that there are fiscal steps that are being taken to make sure that those data are available by the, by the authority, by the regulatory authority. Okay. This is very, very correct. Now, cross-border smuggling. Uh, it's, it's very obvious that, you know, when you have an arbitrage regime, the same thing happens in cocaine. I always refer to this, you know, cocaine movement happens because there's a fresh depression between borders. This is the, just the reality, and people go into it. The same way, when you have a huge difference between your neighbors and your country, you are selling 195 naira and it sells 500, 600 naira across your border. There is nothing, there is nothing you can do to you. You have 4,500 kilometers of, of land border. And the, uh, let me put it in context. When you take a, a, a truck of fuel in Lagos and take it to Maiduguri, you are, you are natural margin that is allowed by, by the market and by circumstance or by the provisions of any other computation that you can do today, probably around 270,000, 300,000 Naira. And if you, take, if you take the same volume across the volume, you sell it as 500 to 600 Naira, you make close to 12 to 17 million Naira. So there is nothing that can stop it. And this will crash completely because that, this, that distinction, that delta is there. Because what you are doing, literally, you are providing FX to your neighbors. You are also providing subsidy on, uh, on commodity for your neighbors. And they, don't, they have no obligation. They don't mind. You know? it's, this is market because people will still take it to them. They don't have to import. They don't have to expose their countries to letters of credit requirement and so on and so forth. All this will collapse and you will see that okay. those volume you are seeing, even if it does happen, it will be market. As okay. you are aware, we are expanding our market. NMPC is going to the, uh, to the countries around us and it will now be a trade rather than smuggling. Okay. okay, real quickly, I'd like to ask a couple of questions. Number one will be, what are the states of our refineries, the turnaround maintenance that we've been hearing for quite a while? Because for all of this to work, we have to have some level of local production too, apart from people spending our forex to bring that in. Also, how will the Dangote refinery buffer as regards what Dangote refinery has an output and what we really need on ground? Uh, thirdly, I'd like to also know the data yeah, on how the, you pull out, all right? What you pull out, uh, as in what you take out of your stock or what people come to take out of your stock. Those three questions as a wrap up. I didn't get the last one. I didn't say, did you, I didn't get the last one around the stock. The, what did you say? The, what you, what's the evacuate from your stock on a daily basis? Well, let me answer if, I, if there's any gap you can come in. First, uh, uh, let me thank you. Uh, first of all, I think it's a perfect opportunity to explain what domestic refining means. It's very important to understand this. There's this misconception 
that once you refine domestically, the price is going to crash to maybe half, half of the price. You know? That's not correct. You know, uh, the distinction between uh, domestic pro processing and, and import is simply one thing. First, uh, two, I'm sorry, it's two things. First of all, it gives you security of supply. That means supply is by your door. You don't need 14 days that we typically need to move product from, say, Europe into Nigeria. So that goes away. You have access to this product. When you have any dislocation in your supply and distribution system, you have very, very little time. You, have, you, have, you require just very short time for you to regulate this and, and, and move around. So it gives you security of supply. This is the number one thing it does. And, and secondly, it does another thing. It creates a, a market around it employments, taxes, and very many other sorts of benefits that will come to the country. Now, when it comes to the price of the commodity itself, remember that petroleum is priced at international price, so it doesn't have local pricing. Therefore, at the gate of the refinery, you are typically pricing it as if you are taking that product at, uh, at Rotterdam or Amsterdam. That means that the combustion of FX, uh, determining the market value is determined by the international international market now. So, but there will be a delta. That delta is the cost of freight from your import location into your country. That will substantially come down. And therefore, you will see a difference in price as a result of the freight difference, which is typically around 21 to 27 naira to take a liter from, say, Rotterdam into Nigeria. And also, some value in in local refining, in, in the sense that probably lower cost of labor and so on, and that you can have another margin of two to three naira that can come as a result of that. So ultimately, at high prices, the distinction is there, but it's not significant. And that needs to be very, very clear to, to, to ordinary. I'm, s I'm sorry, okay, I, I okay, lost the mic, and uh, unfortunately. Okay, okay, we'll just take a quick, uh, uh, what is it called, on time. Uh, so you've been hearing the interview there. I mean, it, it's just been saying a lot while we're allowing fixes, Mike. Uh, uh, okay, so just continue, sir. What do we do uh, going forward with our own refineries? As you are aware, yes, it is delayed the delivery of the Potaco refinery uh, uh, turnaround maintenance or rehabilitation exercise. You know, we don't want to explain it. We don't want to lament. We'll invite our, our colleagues to come with us uh, sometime. If you are you're free, I'll come with you so they can see the level of the work that we are doing. We did have delays. These delays were caused by global supply chain issues, not distant to us not different from any other jurisdiction, but there were delays and we'll deliver this by the end of the year. And of course, there's work going on in one refinery that is already on earnest. And of course, the Kaduna refinery has very different uh, situation. We have awarded the contract for Kaduna refinery. This is also going, going in place. But ultimately, uh, the end result will be that you have going to have a uh, surplus of production in the country by the end of next year. I'm sure that you are aware the Dangote refinery has been commissioned. It will, make, it will go into commercial production in July or in August. And once that happens, you will have significant volume for PMS. That I'm not sure we can say we will have all the volumes that we need immediately. But that will happen. Once that happens and we fix our own refineries, the other small interventions that are going on, the small refineries that are coming on, we don't want to speak about it. Let the realities come on the table. Once that happens, this country will be the hub of petroleum, uh, motor spirit, and other products of uh, petroleum, and it will be the supplier to the West African some region and other regions, and there will be a reversal of the market to other destinations. This, this will happen. But is this something that can crystallize tomorrow? And the answer is no. And we regret this is the situation, but we know that we're going to overcome this. All right. The, all right. Okay. Okay, so, uh, Mr. Kerry, the NNPC has the mandate to guarantee energy security for Nigeria and has been playing that role by being the sole importer of petrol for quite a while. Will this removal make NNPC to cease being the sole supplier of petrol? So how will other oil marketers operate in this new dispensation of no subsidy? All right, I'll take that question again. Mr. Kiari, can you hear me? Yes. All right. Yes, I'll, I do now. I'll, I'll repeat the question. The NNPC has the mandate to guarantee energy security for Nigeria, and it has been playing that role by being the sole importer of petrol for quite a while. Will this removal make NNPC to cease being the sole supplier of petrol? And then how will other oil marketers operate in this new dispensation of no subsidy? First of all, I, I mentioned earlier that by law, at the competition law, NNPC can only do maximum of 30% of supply of the commodity into the market. This is by law, so there will be no monopoly in the market. And also, the removal of the subsidy means that people can access FX freely the same, at the same level with NNPC, 
and all marketing companies will now be able to, to import product and sell in the country. So this is clearly a market-driven situation, and market-driven still means that other players will come in. LMPC, by the way, let me say, put it very clear, you know, this is a very insignificant part of our LMPC business. Of course, it's the most destructive, but obviously it's a part of the business that LMPC is not like, clearly interested in monopolizing. So there is no benefit in it to the LMPC, but there's a requirement of law for us to provide energy security for the country. So we we'll play in this space, we will manage uh, the volume in this space, in the, for the benefit of the ordinary man and the common man. Yes, we have that balancing role in terms of providing energy security. It's just provision of the law. Now, private sector will definitely come in because there will be access to FX for all and there will be alternative access to FX. Back at Biden, when the FX regime is normalized, it means that uh, people can freely bring in FX into the country. There will be multiple platforms of access to FX and this competition will set. As we're already doing today, in HGO, just an example, uh, annual daily consumption of HGO in the country is around 12 million liters a day. Today, NMPC makes less than 20% of those volume into the market. Uh, the others are doing it, they are sourcing FS even at the parallel market. But once the market is now stabilized, the FS market is stabilized, you will see more players. Our target is to remain at the provisions of the law around the 30% of the market, and we'll encourage that, we'll make sure that happens. But of course, uh, is that something that can kick in tomorrow? Yes, there's always transition to everything. Well, we know that we have a plan. We're not going to leave any gap. Uh, this supply will be sustained until the market comes into play and will gradually exit, not just by choice, by the sheer forces of the market. Once we see more volume coming into the market, we have to reduce our volume because there will be no market for it. Okay, so um, just to wrap up then, uh, you said that the supply will be sustained. Uh, help us understand how we're going to, or timeline, within which we'll see the queues disappearing. And what will be your final word to Nigerians who are suffering under this pressure? What will be your final word to them? First of all, uh, I think we need to understand why the queues are there in the first instance. Uh, first is uh, panic. Uh, panic in the sense, not what we used to know where there are supply gap, because are, you don't have supply gap. Uh, customers will see, as soon as the indication was made, that we could exit the subsidy regime, people will rush to the fuel station, let me buy the cheap fuel before they change the prices. This is very typical. When people go into these fuel stations, they will buy, instead of buying 10,000 10, 10, naira fuel, they will buy 20, 30,000. Of course, that creates the pressure. It causes the delays in... In, in filling the tanks of the cars in the fuel station, and naturally you will have queues coming up. The second reason is inventory management. Oil marketing companies will know that they have to go back. They know the current market realities. They know that if you just dispose it at that price, you can't go back to the market. It's very typical. They will have to have a sense of the price in the market for them to determine what, what happens. And that's why many fuel stations, of course, except the major marketers and, and NNPC, you know, we, we continue to sell. And that's why the very fact that we, should, we see the market realities and ultimately, many fuel stations shut in their, their fuel station or even the number of pumps that they're using to dispense for, to enable them to uh, be able to go back to the market. So, so this is what really caused the queue. And, and of course, uh, this will dissipate. I don't think it's going to last probably two, three days. It will go because uh, now the realities are got the certainty around the pricing environment and no one is in doubt around the pricing environment. Therefore, this will go back. And of course, the very fact that supplies are there, even at the depots, you remember that yesterday, because of the price uncertainty, a number of depots didn't operate uh, for very obvious reason, so that they can have clarity around this. And I am aware this morning that loading has come in, in nearly all the depots on the basis of the new realities that are present. So this gap will vanish. And of course, uh, uh, naturally also, because it is not a downward review in prices, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, not, it's an upward review in prices, People will, will stop stay, taking too much more than they need. And of course, those queues in the fuel station will naturally go. It's not the same station that we have always seen around fuel queues. This is very different. This is a price-determined queue situation, and I believe that this will go away very shortly. Well, thank you very much for your time this morning, Mr. Mele Kiari, and for giving us the assurance that we should see the queues begin to dissipate in two to three days' time. Mr. Mele Kiari is GCEO NNPC.